artificial intelligence is everywhere now. Over the past year, tools like ChatGPT, Dali and Stable Diffusion have turned what was previously a pretty marginal technology into headline news. Suddenly everyone wants to talk about both the potential and dangers of AI. Will it revolutionise workplaces? Will it ruin art? Will it lead to the complete and total extinction of humanity? You know, light everyday questions. The sheer momentum of the AI hype train means that navigating these conversations can be super difficult. The line between fact and science fiction just seems to have become so blurred, sometimes seemingly intentionally. To try and get my head around things, I asked someone who's been researching AI for many years now to join me for a chat. Jordan Harrod. Jordan, welcome. Welcome to the show. Uh, happy day after the 4th of July. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it's, <did> you? <laughs> it's not something that I really celebrate, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, ha happy that happy that it's over then and that uh, Boston is back to normal. Oh, certainly. I, I, I live uh, close to where the festivities are, and so... Every time, every time the fireworks are, are gearing up, the whole area becomes like a police state for like the week before as they set up for everything and, you know, make sure they can handle anything that might happen. So I, I am happy that I can roam the city more freely. <laughs> you know, gradually, gradually get back to the day to day. I mean, yeah. And thank you so much for giving up um, a, a, a bit of your day to, uh, to, to chat to me. I'm sure you are incredibly uh, busy. Yeah, no, um, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I mean, for, for anyone for anyone that hasn't uh, come across your your videos before, um, you are a, uh, a a YouTuber. You are a PhD candidate at MIT. Uh, and c can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, like the kind of uh, non specialist guide to exactly what to, to to kind of what your your research is in? Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm a PhD candidate at um, primarily MIT. It's it's technically a joint program for we we joke that uh, it's for people who were pre med and undergrad who then realized that they didn't want to be doctors but were still like curious about the concept of med school. Uh, so <laughs> we we run between. MIT and Harvard Med, we get to take the med school courses. We get to be medical students in a hospital for three months. Um, and Ooh. then ideally we take that knowledge of, of how the clinic works and what a day-to-day -day experience looks like and incorporate that into our work so that we're actually designing tools that, you know, solve healthcare problems, but can also be implemented in hospitals, which is is often uh, a barrier that doesn't come up until someone publishes their great idea, and then clinicians are like, "Yeah, we're not going to do that." So, mm -hmm. um, it's 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 lots of fun. Um, I work on uh, a couple things broadly. I'm I'm interested in um, brain stimulation and machine learning for various uh, neuroscience and neurotech applications. Um, in the past, I've worked on machine learning for MRI reconstruction. So if an MRI uh, uh, acquires a, an image that has errors in it, how can we identify that and then either rescan or correct the errors in the process? Uh, I've also worked on tissue engineering. Uh, so I used to work on 3D printing uh, living cells and using them to, to uh, create uh, replacements for like your meniscus and your knee. And so I worked on doing computer modeling on like bone mineralization and how we can design these things to, to uh, connect to the actual bones in your knee a little bit better. Um, and I also did some work in privacy preserving machine learning. Um, so, so I feel like I come from kind of a jack of all trades within medical healthcare applications background. Um, yeah. And and yeah, that's that's what I do when I'm not doing YouTube, which is my other job, <laughs> uh, where I make videos about AI, uh, primarily from an educational standpoint, but also sometimes I just turn on the camera and rant about things. <laughs> I mean, all those projects sound um, amazing. I was, I was reading your um, kind of summary on the uh, either on the MIT or Harvard um, website, and it was uh, you know, saying how you're doing machine learning and also brain machine interfaces. And I was like, okay, these these are like two incredibly uh, I don't know two 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 things that feel like they are sort of very sort of cutting edge uh, 
uh, things. That must be really exciting. Yeah, it's funny because I, going into my PhD, I, I didn't choose my project or my advisors based on like, so-and-so is super high profile. This is a project that's going to mm. change the world, things like that. Um, I went into grad school not really having a specific uh, uh, basic science interest, I guess, not having like a disease model that I really wanted to work on or, or anything like that. I was mostly just interested in developing tools. Uh, and I wanted to work with people who would support my development as a student. And if the project mm. was cool and interesting on top of that, you know, that's all my boxes are checked. Like we're good. Um, yeah. except inadvertently I ended up working with two of the highest profile people in my field, uh, on a topic that has become increasingly relevant. So, so I, I definitely, uh, stumbled my way into that a bit. Yeah. That, like that was something I was jotting down while I was sort of, um, prepping for the episode and, and taking some notes was, yeah, I was really interested in what's that been like, because, because you've been sort of in, involved in AI research for, um, quite some time um, before it was sort of uh, sort of hipsters and sort of like suddenly <laughs> before it was cool. Um, what has that been like for it to suddenly be the thing that sort of everyone like like so many people are talking about? So many people have a have an opinion on. So many like has that been exciting? Has it been strange? Has it been frustrating? Like a, maybe a mix of all of those things. Yeah, I was gonna say it's been all of the above. I think um, especially as someone who who you know, did the work that I did at, at Stanford and machine learning from RI reconstruction and then was was introduced and kind of mentored into the field by people who are are very interested in issues related to fairness and bias. Um, that was always the framework that I looked at these systems through. And that was always the perspective I was coming from, even if I was designing more technical systems as opposed to coming from a, a more social sciences side. Uh, mm. And so I think before it was like cool to, to be into AI, it was frustrating because that perspective was something that I think was undervalued in the field um, and concerns about like how we use these systems were often kind of brushed aside by, by other researchers in the field. But at the same time, now that there is so much more discussion around these topics, um, you still see like a lot of misinformation and like a lot of discussion about fairness and bias, which I think is great, um, but not necessarily a lot of actual change or action on that front, which is a little bit frustrating. Um, and, and I think in addition to having, in addition to that kind of work um, often being undervalued by, by people within the field, um, you now have, you know, everyone on Twitter voicing their opinion who like have never <laughs> worked with yeah. these systems at all. And so you're just like, okay, this is a fun place to be. I mean, I think it's great in terms of, of more people being interested in it and more people being able to reach more people who, who want to learn about this kind of stuff. Um, I think that at the same time, the, 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 I had to turn off my like Google news uh, alert on like the term artificial intelligence because I just opened my email in the morning and be, angry <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's been it's been overall good um mm. and and cool and interesting and, and great to see increased interest and engagement on how we use these systems um i suppose i hope that the discussion would have gone in a slightly different direction than it has but here we are is that is that that, that it's um I, I guess is it is it is it difficult dealing with um, I guess you end up with kind of two poles where you have real kind of hype on one end that kind of maybe doesn't ask those questions about ethics that, that you're talking about and also wants to use it to kind of, um, you know, just auto-generate a load of YouTube videos or whatever it is and then kind of uh, just uh, outright criticism on the other hand, I guess, of the kind of... Uh, I don't, I don't want to say naysayers because I get because because mm -hmm. so, some of it will be kind of useful criticism, but I guess Absolutely, you end up yeah. kind of in the middle of that um, pathway. Yeah, I think that the there was always hype around AI, um, at least since I've I've been in the field. Mm. Uh, I think that it was quieter, <laughs> um, mm. and it wasn't being platformed by by. 
uh, quite as many influential people. Um, mm. and, and so I think that in, I guess I would say in a similar way to, to, I don't know, lots of other issues in the U S um, it's been frustrating to see how it's been politicized in ways that are just not helpful to the discourse uh, on these topics. And I think that's the thing that's like, uh, uh, something that I think I'm still figuring out how to make content around and how to engage with, because at the end of the day, you know, do I enjoy ranting at things on Twitter? Like, yeah, but my, my ultimate goal is, is to help people understand like the actual potential consequences of these systems and not get into this like hype debate over, over things that aren't really of concern to, to, to real people, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think AI, I, I guess is an interesting one in terms of the fact that even if we don't actually know, like for those of us out, outside the kind of research field or outside the industry who don't necessarily have uh, much of an understanding, if any understanding, and certainly not a deep understanding of actually how it works, a lot of our uh, knowledge of it, I guess, and, and feelings towards it are in some way kind of informed by our knowledge of the sci-fi mm -hmm. kind of aura around it. Um, I, I actually want... Um, uh, when I when I was um, when I was doing my PhD, I saw a bunch of like post grad presentations, and this was kind of in a human in sort of humanities department in the university. But um, the the person was giving a presentation for a kind of postdoc pitch for a project mm -hmm. that was about how real world uh, science um, developments and, and inventions and innovations were pushed by science fiction mm -hmm. and kind of the ways in which sometimes scientists and researchers decide which direction they're going to go in with a particular project based yeah. on oh there's a cool thing we'll try and make that happen um in reality uh, and and ai i mean I, I i don't know how much of it is the product of people trying to make something that they've seen on film a reality. But I guess it, it has a baggage to it mm -hmm. that has existed for a long time before it's actually existed. Yeah, no. So I guess I have two thoughts. One is that um, I'm a huge sci-fi and fantasy nerd. And I I won't say that that's what got me into the field, but I do think that um, they are they are overlapping loves in my life. Um, I, like I, I love the doing the research and I also love seeing the sci-fi and and reading the sci-fi and and looking at world building and and how technologies intersect with that um uh the second thought is that so it's it's the the dynamics between i guess narratives around the potential of ai and the actual development of ai are uh interesting for for a couple of reasons um the first thing I'll note is actually that so so AI development started, I believe, in the 30s, the 1930s, um, and at the time was like super basic, like if then statements, like not not at all the stuff that we have now. Uh, and it went through a, a bit of an ice age uh, at one point because we just didn't have the computational tools to be able to, to develop things like large language models. Uh, and so it was the advent of GPUs in, in the early 2000s and mostly the early 2000s um, that, that were able to, that were optimized to perform matrix multiplication, which is kind of foundational to things like neural networks. Um, that led to kind of the start of that exponential AI boom and interest in the research and interest in the work and, and people being able to take, you know, stuff that... <sighs> Neil Stevenson was writing about in books in the '90s and and turned it into real life. Um, so so I certainly think that they they can be related, um, but there were also definitely just like technology development factors that I think have have deeply tied into mm. um, the progression of of these systems over call it the last twenty five years. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating to hear like just how long people have been kind of working on some of the stuff that has been foundational to it. And um, I mean, like my, uh, I'm going to make an assumption about the sort of 
my audience that might be listening uh but might be listening to this podcast or watching this podcast um uh and i've got i've got a sense that a lot of people will be kind of a bit skeptical about ai in general Mm -hmm. um most probably coming from a standpoint of i guess two things of uh, one being some of the the kind of ethics stuff that 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 you talked about already and some of the also the kind of what consequences will this potentially have on 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 jobs and creativity and all these kinds of things um and also the kind of response to a tech cycle of hype as well mm-hmm. i guess that yeah, a, a year ago, everything was going to be the metaverse. Yeah, and that didn't quite happen, and uh, and now AI has come along, and there's the tendency that some people might view that as the next version of mm-hmm. uh, the metaverse potentially. Yeah. Uh, so, so the sort of idea behind inviting you on was um, that I thought it'd be really cool to discuss. Actually, you know, what what is the nuts and bolts of this technology a little bit? Um, what are some of the cool things it can do? Um. And but I knew you would also have some really interesting thoughts on some of those ethical questions, these safety questions, um, uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the uh, the starting point then with with some questions that I feel like for you are, are both super easy and potentially ones that sort of eighteen months since the dam burst on AI tools are alike incredibly boring now um i hope you'll humor <laughs> me um uh is like i guess i guess in the, mo- in the most basic and broadest way like what actually are we talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence if that is a if if there is a kind of central glue that's holding it yeah so it's it's a good question um i i made a a video about this i think a year ago um because it has become this amorphous hype term that means everything and nothing at the same time in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that there there are academic definitions, there are kind of uh, uh, more more public definitions. I tend to talk about AI as systems that aim to replicate human intelligence. And I intentionally keep my definition to be fairly broad because First of all, machine learning is is a subset of AI. The the field of machine learning is is a subset because depending on the type of intelligence that you're trying to replicate, it's not necessarily that complicated. Like you don't necessarily need a 1.5 billion parameter model to to do certain things. Um, yeah. And so, because the field has been around for like a hundred years. Um, there, there are examples of works that came before we were able to make models this big, um, and and those would still, you know, under a, a broad umbrella, be considered artificial intelligence. Um, at the same time, especially I think when it's used in in media, you you the definition becomes even broader in a way that I think is interesting. Um, so mm. a, a, a fun example is um, the. I believe Vice originally reported it. I can't remember who else did, but the the story a few weeks ago about um, the simulation, the AI simulation, where the AI system uh, was was operating an autonomous drone and it decided to take out its operator, and then it turned out yeah, that it was actually just like a bunch of guys in a room, like speaking in hypotheticals <laughs> about like. It was. I think they actually had like a, a sci-fi book club or something, and it was basically like that group of people getting together and being like, "Well, what if you were the AI and I gave you this directive? What would you do?" Like there was, there were no computers involved. <laughs> it was not computation at all. But that's something that we're referring to as AI. So, so I think it has become this like very broad and and. Uh, I mean, speaking as an academic, um, especially just not useful term <laughs> in a lot of ways because mm-hmm. it's it's not very precise. Um, I think that I guess I would say in the last few months, and I, I also always say um, I'm saying this on July 5th because God knows what will happen by between now and when this comes out. Um, I've I've done many an interview in which it does not come out for another month and it's like well 
The things I jotted that I said that down at the time were yeah. correct. <laughs> I jotted that down because I'd seen that you'd you'd said in one of your videos about you know you you feel as yeah. though you need to say the date because then tomorrow you yeah know, they exactly. release a new GPT or something and <laughs> I'll be like, well, I said that when we were on like GPT two and then GPT four came out two weeks later, so. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily helpful. Um, so, so yeah, I think often when we talk about AI these days, we are talking about language models. We're talking about large language models. We're talking about things like, um, chat GPT, GPT-4, BARD, et cetera. Mm, I've, de- I've definitely seen a few things. Oh, there, was, there was definitely something last week and I can't remember exactly what it was where it was pitched to me in the marketing email or the, uh, update notes or whatever it was, um, as being AI enabled. And I thought, I'm pretty certain you could you've been able to do this for a long time yep and it's just a nice kind Mm -hmm. of sort of trendy way of um, rebranding it it feels very Um, similar to um in in the US the FDA doesn't regulate the use of the term all natural so you can put all natural on like any food products and it's not it doesn't it's it's whatever you want it to mean and I think you know AI enabled AI supported this product uses AI Mm. has like fallen into that category of things where it's like yeah you could like put it on anything kind of there were i mean that that was something that always got me about the mark zuckerberg metaverse video was that he sort of would project all these future things and then there was some stuff that where i was watching and going this is this is just a vr game Mm -hmm. but this is not this is not the but you can sort of pretend you've done more by kind of slapping it slapping on um but i mean as as you say i think that the tool that people are most likely or tools that people are most likely to have uh, heard the most about maybe experimented with a little bit are these kind of are are the sort of chatbot text based um tools such as chat gpt uh bard maybe um and these are i'm guessing what you're calling or, or based upon large language models is that correct yes um, so, like, how um, how do they kind of what what's the, what's the uh, explain it to a five year old of uh, kind of how 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 these are working when someone's saying mm-hmm. please write me a haiku about um, Big Bird um, <laughs> what 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 what's the kind what's what's kind of going on there Yeah, I I think that I guess I don't know five year olds are what in like pre K kindergarten. Um, the 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 comparison that i tend to use these days is is that you know at some point during math class we all learned like y equals mx plus b and Mm -hmm. every one of these algorithms can be boiled down to that at the end of the day um all of these systems are are math formulas that are designed to try to find the best match between the data you give it and the labels for said data and and so when we look at things like large language models they they are systems that have looked at a bunch of text and tried to create a formula that says if you input you know i would like a haiku about big bird like here's what that looks like based on what it's seen so here's Mm here's what that should look like. And I think that's why the 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 data sets of of these things are often probably not interrogated quite as closely as they should be. And in the case of mm-hmm. things like ChatGPT, uh, we don't know what it was trained on because OpenAI hasn't published that. So um, it's it's everything in a lot of ways comes down to the data. And there are certainly, you know, things about transformer models, which is what um, ChatGPT is based on, uh, that that are different from neural networks that are optimized to do different things. But at the end of the day, it's 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 all a pattern matching formula. Mm. And, and like, I mean, you, you say we don't know exactly what it's read. We we don't know whether it's read the the whole internet. We don't know whether it's read Google Book. Like, we don't mm-hmm. know sort of which bits it's got. Um, but when it when it kind of reads. Uh, because I guess that the sort of GPT is that it's generative, pre- a pre-trained transformer. Is that correct? I believe so. It's I've been a while my, since I've looked. Done, <laughs> done my searching right. Um, which, which I gather is that the generative bit that it creates something that mm-hmm. wasn't there before. Yeah. Pre-trained means it's sort of 
done its reading already. It's not looking it up at the time. Yep. And the Transformer bit probably sounds more complicated uh, that my brain probably won't wrap itself around. Transformers are essentially a, a specific type of model. It's a specific okay. Uh, okay. formula that, that you can use in these settings. That's, that sounds like the sort of 201 uh, class. Um, <laughs> so I, say, I can show you a picture, but it's not. I don't think it's going to help. <laughs> um, but but when, when we say it's like pre-trained, mm -hmm. um, or when you say it's pre-trained, um, so, so, it's re so it's reading all that information and then it's trans and then the thing it is storing is the formula rather than the information I itself then. Is that the case? Yes. Um, it, it becomes, I guess I would say the distinction between the formula and the information is, is a little bit of a gray area. So it's not okay. necessarily saving like words, but... Mm. It is it is a map. It's it's a way of mapping an input to an output, and so there is information that you could glean from said map. Ah, uh, you could you could kind of de deconstruct what is what it's been trained on from the f sort of formula it's got. Do you mean? Kind of. So so in I don't know that I've seen anyone do this with transformer networks. It would actually be kind of interesting to see. Um, but there is a, a paper from several years ago um, that looked at neural networks, convolutional neural networks, which uh, look at image data, um, and looked at the the mapping, the formula, the numbers that that uh, that model uh, was was trained to optimize for uh, based on face inputs and label outputs. And what it found was that um, uh, a lot of the initial um, kind of initial layer, first layer uh, uh, neurons in the network were looking at areas of high contrast. So places where you see images go from light to dark, um, if we're talking about uh, uh, something like a JPEG, basically values of zero to values of 255 really quickly. Uh, from there, the neurons constructed facial features. So they were able to say, okay, you know, this, this combination of high contrast areas is an eyebrow or the edge of your lip or your ear or like mm -hmm. your chin or something like that. Um, and, and then I believe it was a model that was looking to, to label uh, uh, images of people by uh, gender, uh, gender presentation. And, um, Eventually, as you as you move further through the model, um, the 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 size of the features grows. So you go from looking at these areas of high contrast in a photo to larger facial features, and so that's all to say that can you pull information necessarily about like specific data from that that was in the training data? Not necessarily, um, but does that mapping tell you something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess the uh, um, one example I, I guess I've seen is that. Oh, sorry, another program popped up in front of the <laughs> uh, in front of the program. And um, one one, ex one example I guess I've seen is the uh, Getty Images case, where I can't think exactly what company it is that they are either considering taking legal action against or mm. have done so already. Um, because and, and the, the the way they realized that they'd been training images against their images was that they started to get a wobbly Getty images mm -hmm. uh, watermark. Yeah. You know, you, you said I want a, a photo of someone playing no, um, like professional kidding, football, just... maybe. <laughs> and yeah, kind of like which doesn't doesn't quite say it, but you can you can yeah. definitely tell what it is. So you can sort of tell the information that's come in yes. from some of the information that's come out the yeah. other side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and are, are the are the image based models are they much, are they more complicated than the text based? I think it's interesting that I think those of us that don't have all of the scientific knowledge behind these systems, I think can sort of imagine the ways in which uh, the text based models work. Um, uh, you, you know, so the explainers sort of makes a certain amount of sense from the ways in which it can uh you know it, it predicts the next word based on the previous set of words and kind of goes through and uh, manages to make a bit of text mm -hmm. are, are the images ones much uh more complicated it, it started to make sense to me then when you were talking about oh well it looks for contrast and it looks for 
Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to model architecture. So um, it depends on how you've set up the model in the first place. You can, so, so um, if we think about things like Dolly, which are based on models like GBT, which is Dolly is a, an image generation, you input text, you get an image from it. Um, mm. I wouldn't say that Dolly is significantly more complicated than something like a chat GPT. Um, mm. But it all depends on on the model that you built underneath. And you can build like really simple machine learning models that do relatively straightforward tasks that are not very complex. You can you can build language models that are are not complex. <laughs> um, mm. So so it, it tends to uh, depend on what you're optimizing for, um, and and the data set that you're using, and you know what level of complexity is needed to solve the problem more than the the specific type of data that you're using. Mm. I think what I what I've found interesting, which which now sort of I think makes sense to me, was that I guess one of the things I was thinking about is that text to text to an outsider at least seems like it would be much easier than image uh, than the system having to learn image to text and then text back to image. But I think your kind of way of explaining a bit of actually it's just it's just taking a formula of what will be the output to the input and then using it the other way around that that actually starts to make a lot more a lot more sense to my kind of outsider brain yeah um, and i guess i can say for for so if we think about something like a a, a gpt and and why it works better than other um because people have tried using things like neural networks to to make text generation models um the the architecture is the thing the math that we're using is the thing that that um makes these models better at generating human realistic text. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because they've been designed to include things like attention, which is is basically a, a method that um, allows a model to weight different parts of a sentence or, or different parts of a block of text. Um, and, and memory is another thing that comes up a lot, um, which, which is basically just the concept that like, as a model is generating a paragraph. So if you ask ChatGPT to, you know, write your sponsor copy, which I do quite often, um, it's, it's the idea that it, as it's generating, is taking into account the earlier thing that it generated. So okay. when, when we write as people, um, if you're writing an essay for the SAT or whatever they have in the UK, um, you you start writing, you know, in this essay, I will do X, Y, Z, and then you make your first point, and then you make your second point, and then you circle back to the front. Um, mm -hmm. That is not something that is intrinsic to a language model unless you put it in, uh, which is also why when you see, uh, uh, I think the current version of, of GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 are pretty good at it, but earlier versions of, of GPT, uh, if you asked for something longer than like a couple sentences, it would often devolve into like nonsense or just repeating the same things over and over and over again. Um, because it didn't, it, 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 there was no back reference to, to be yeah, able to be like, you know, you started here and then you're looking at the last, you know, 20 characters of everything as you go further and further. And then you end up getting stuck in these weird loops. So, um, text can also be really complicated. <laughs> hey, I hope you're enjoying my chat with Jordan. If you are and you'd like to check out further episodes of the show, then you'll probably want to know that every single one comes out a full two weeks early over on my streaming service, Nebula. Perhaps you've heard a bit about Nebula already. It's a premium streaming service built by myself and a bunch of other clever YouTubers and video creators. Recently, we've been working really hard to increase the amount of exclusive content on the platform. This includes exclusive video essays that you won't find anywhere else. If you want to check out Lindsay Ellis's latest videos on The Lord of the Rings, E.T. and Guy Fieri, for example, they are 100% exclusive to Nebula. Additionally, all subscriptions to Nebula now also include access to Nebula classes, in which creators share the skills and strategies they use to write, produce and edit their videos. 
This includes my own hour and a bit long Nebula class, How to Research Like a PhD Student, in which I take you through my process for researching my main channel videos. Further, as I mentioned a moment ago, both the audio and video versions of every single episode of Induction are released a full fortnight early on Nebula too. If you want to sign up for Nebula, then the best value way of doing so is by using my custom link go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. Using that link will bag you a full 40% off an annual plan, meaning that you can get access to Nebula for just $2.50 a month. Which is a pretty good deal, right? It's a great way to get access to tons of bonus clever content, whilst also supporting my work specifically, as some of that money comes back to us to help us continue to make more episodes of Induction and main channel videos too. That link again is go.nebula.tv forward slash Induction. But for now, back to my chat with Jordan. Um, <laughs> so like over the past, so we, we kind of got this initial boom, maybe 18 months ago where we kind of got Dali and then we got, um, I, I'm not gonna get my order right, but kind of stable diffusion. And then eventually we got, um, chat GPT and what's been, I mean, I think I, one of the things I find really interesting about watching this as a, a development to me, which is quite nascent, I guess, and is, is feels like a kind of stumbling toddler, uh, even if, even if for you, it's it, this, this is maybe something, something that's much more long-term and therefore, um, it's less kind of fresh to you, I guess. But um, but I find it interesting kind of watching the problems emerge in terms of the technical stuff and then get fixed. I I, I think, I, I guess it's something that the fact that, that they've kind of been released as beta versions is that we get to kind of share in, which is kind of cool in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. And I, 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 I was interested in the ways in which, um, I guess the, the first mm -hmm. thing that, okay. that, that seemed to happen and then seemed to get better again uh, was mid journey hands um that was a really oh interesting my God, yeah. thing um do you i mean i i don't know how much knowledge you have of their particular system or would be able to explain it but but sort of how do you go about fixing something like that because that's been really interesting that it sort of emerged as a problem and then clearly they've done something behind the scenes which has now made it mm -hmm. um possible to fix is it do you just show it loads more hands yeah, I was gonna say the the first the the first place to look is usually the data set. So uh, if you have a data set that does not show a lot of people's hands, um, which it's it's it has been funny to um, I suppose see uh, 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 see the the not I wouldn't even call them edge cases, but but see the places where these models fail. Mm -hmm. um, and see which ones I can look at and be like, well, yeah. Um, and which ones it's like, you know, I never thought about like what percentage of photos in like the ImageNet data set have hands. Mm, <laughs> mm. Like that was just not, it's not something I ever considered. Um, turns out really important, but like just not, not ever something that, that crossed my mind until, until it started showing up. Um, so, so yeah, I would say the the first thing um, is is definitely you know looking through the data set and basically cataloging like, so do we just not have a lot of hands in here or like what? Um, and and if you can fix that, then then adding more photos, um, you might use synthetic data in this case, um, which is using uh, generating data based on existing data. Um, so so if you have uh, a set of photos that that have hands. Um, essentially performing various transformations on that data, flipping the picture vertically, horizontally, something like that to, mm -hmm. to expand your data set uh, quickly. Ideally, you also just like get more photos uh, that are original, but oh, so it, it depends on the issue. So it could have, uh, like, I don't know, if all the photos of it's got of, are of people kind of doing jazz hands or something, it might have never seen an upside down hand and therefore mm -hmm. that could be... Oh, it is, it is really interesting. How, A, how much <laughs> of it comes back to the data that goes in, but also just the the weird... I, I, I saw a story, and forgive me if this is repeating a, a story that you've told in one of your videos, and I'm just repeating it back to you, but I um, I, I, I saw a story about um, an, an AI model that was intended to spot uh, like skin conditions or to spot whether... Yep. And skin cancers and they were not trained on yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had, and they realized that all the photos of of sort of um skin that was unwell i'm not sure what the phrase for that is mm -hmm. but um 
had ru- had rulers next to them. Yep. And because they were all pathology samples. <laughs> and <laughs> yep. skin didn't, and therefore. The, 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 there are a lot of examples of that, especially I think in 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 the the image data set world where um, the the you think that you're training a system to recognize you know does this person have abnormal skin issues or normal skin issues and then like it turns out that all of the pictures that had you know abnormal skin issues had like a, a, a um, uh, a scale bar <laughs> at the bottom and so it's just figuring out like scale bar no scale bar scale bar no scale bar <laughs> yeah. um so so that is definitely something that happens um the other thing that can happen um which was actually the example that that i thought of when when you started um mentioning this example is um i believe google a couple of years ago um released a a model that was designed to detect skin cancer um and it was an interesting problem that they ran into um as someone who also takes med school courses mm-hmm. um essentially if if you look at med school textbooks for skin conditions uh the photos in the textbook tend to be from caucasian people from from mm-hmm. people with light skin um and so it was it became very quickly apparent that um they had used a similar data set in order to do this and so if you were a person of color it just didn't work <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because the model had not seen, you know, ex- examples of um, what these conditions look like on people of color. And in fact, you know, in a lot of cases, although this has this has changed in, in recent years as, as medical education has changed in the U.S., um, doctors also haven't seen pictures of, of people of color with mm-hmm. with different skin conditions. And so especially if if the the differentiating factor of the condition is like your skin changes like pigment color like if you're super fair skinned it probably looks obvious whereas if you're not it can be a lot more subtle um to 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 detect um and and so i think that um and and i think this kind of extends into the larger conversation around like fairness and and concerns around uses of these systems um a lot of it is just amplifying human stuff (laughs) <laughs> a lot of it is is um you know biases and 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 inequalities that existed well before these systems did um and and the the problem and the concern as it relates to to fairness work is that uh it's easier for these things to go unnoticed when you're automating it mm. i guess um I guess to, to, to kind of start, cross over into, into talking about about some of the uh, kind of ethics and um, safety kind of aspect of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. How how does the thought process go into that? Because I mean, as you're saying, if you if you were to even if you were to find a completely representative uh, set of data for whatever you were showing it about the world around us um mm-hmm. particularly if if using something like chat gpt or something and you decided you were going to create a new country and you were going to base all its law you were going to ask chat gpt mm-hmm. to write all the new laws for this country to write a constitution and uh, all the various kind of country starter pack um if you were to find representative laws from the the world um as they exist you would probably create the same inequalities that exist in yep. the world as it mm-hmm. um, exists. So, what is the thinking around um, what data does that? De- like, do these things get taken into account when, say, OpenAI is doing their work, or to what extent is is the industry kind of? I, I guess they must be aware of the things, but to what extent does it? Yeah. So, so I think that there's 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 kind of problems at multiple levels. Um, one, I mean, so a, I can't speak for OpenAI. I yeah. don't know how they do stuff on the back end. Um, I think that especially now um, and, and over the last year or two, um, there are particular things that that I think companies releasing these kinds of systems try to test for because they know that if they do not, it will be a PR nightmare for mm-hmm. them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So so I think that um, for for kind of profit motive reasons it has become uh, more of a norm to to interrogate systems um on on their various biases and um 
the 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 ways that they can fail to perform as as intended. Um, I think the I I. I I did a video like three years ago, I think, um, on how to make AI fair. Um, and my comment in that video was like, so step like zero is like people approach problems and, and approach framing problems based on their lived experience, based on, you know, their own unintended biases, based on their, their concept of the world. And like, that's how people always work. That's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. Um, But it does mean that when you design a a problem that you'd like for, that you'd like to design a system to solve, um, you can inadvertently impart Mm -hmm. biases just in the process of, you know, deciding that like, I want to solve problem X and this is how I am formulating that problem. Um, there was a, a nature paper a couple years ago that um, looked at this, that looked at an example of this in healthcare where uh, these, these researchers um, developed a software system that was designed to um, indicate uh, uh, for patients who had uh, uh, particular health conditions who needed a higher level of care and, and who did not. Uh, and, they they had a data set of patient data and you know lab work and outcomes and diagnoses and and various um doctor's notes and things like that and they also had how much people spend on healthcare uh and and so the the model that they developed and deployed ended up um disproportionately not recommending people of color for higher standards of care when they were equivalently sick in a, in a medical sense uh because one of the the factors that was heavily weighted by the system was mm. how much money do you spend on healthcare? Mm. And if you are a person of color in a Western society, you know, the history of medical racism, uh, uh, intersection between race and class, like chances are you spend less money <laughs> mm. than, than uh, a white person does. Um, and so that's not gr- a great proxy in terms of like how severe your health is, but it is the proxy that the model ended up weighting strongly. So like, that's an example of a case where it's like the people going into it, you know, had good intentions. They wanted to make sure that people who, who were, were severely sick, got the care that they needed. And they asked a question that they thought would represent the problem. Well, and they had a blind spot. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I think there are, you know, many reasons why I'm I'm always a proponent of like diverse groups of researchers and AI development. Um, but one of them is just that like when it comes to to bias and fairness stuff, a lot of the time, uh someone else who has a different lived experience from you might catch something that you just wouldn't. Yeah. And and that's not to I feel like when 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 people bring that up, um there are people who often I suppose are offended by that or, or take it as a, a a negative reflection on themselves. And like, I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. Like we all have different, we all grew up in different places with, with different cultures and different finances and family situations and like whatever, like that's just how people are. (laughs) Um, But because you can't know everything and you can't, you know, be able to step into anyone else's shoes, like, wouldn't you want to, to have more voices in the room to be able to be like, Mm -hmm hey, like, this is something that we should also consider when when we're developing XYZ. I think I, I, I was just thinking about a, a story that I heard. And this wasn't AI related, but was um, kind of computer development related, web development related. Um, a few years back in, in the UK, there was a, a, a thing where someone had discovered that if you were signing up to, I can't remember what the service was, um, and you put in uh, doctor is your title and that you're a woman that the system just wouldn't let you go through um it would uh, mm-hmm. for, for whatever re- i don't know exactly what the flaw was that would come up um and and they they worked out that it was just that the team that had developed it um were, were all guys and that and therefore had tested it but had kind of tested each variable at one time and i guess mm-hmm. they'd probably gone imagine if I was a doctor, imagine if I was a woman, imagine if, and they'd done all yep. those things separately and just never, but not like, um, yeah. and yeah, 
as you say, hadn't intentionally created a system that would do that, but just had those blind spots where um, where they hadn't thought to check. So when people talk about uh, AI risk, because I think the, the, the ethics questions are, are some of those that feel like they've been in the air for those of us sort of outside of AI stuff, stuff maybe some of us have at least been aware of. Mm -hmm. um, but over the past six months, maybe definitely much more recently, um, since the big AI boom of ChatGPT being released um, and all the uh, text-to-image tools, mm -hmm. there's began to be this discussion about AI risk and kind of AI as an existential risk as well. Um, is that related? Is that related? I, I guess the the kind of the kind of outsider kind of tech skeptic in me goes, well, if the AI is doing bad, you unplug it. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess is it the more further down the line stuff of you know you redesign your healthcare system around uh, and you've accidentally waited it for anyone who's got lots of money and therefore had the expensive insurance before now automatically goes to the front of the queue and therefore riots break out and is is it the sort of further down the line stuff rather than skynet is it skynet in terminator um yeah what what, what are those conversations around ai risk i guess yeah it's it's been i would i, I guess i would say um i i know i mentioned earlier that um the i'm happy that we are talking more about ai in in the general public um the direction of the conversation is not necessarily the direction that I really wanted to go in. <laughs> uh, and, and the kind of artificial general intelligence slash artificial super intelligence existential risk dialogue has definitely been a great example of that. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that I think it's unfortunate that like AI safety, AI alignment, and like AI and fairness and bias are not just like one field because I feel like a lot of us have the same goals, which is to design safe systems, but just different mm -hmm. concerns. Um, I think that when... I, I, I think that um, when when people in, in the fairness communities, I suppose, let me back up slightly. Um, usually the, the, the kind of dichotomy, what I would call a place dichotomy that, that usually comes up is that people in the fairness side um, want to talk about current harms and, and people on the, the AI risk side want to talk about future harms. Um, I don't think that that's a real dichotomy. I think that people on the fairness side uh, uh, use current harms as an example of potential future consequences <laughs> mm -hmm. of these systems. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, that's why I say that that I feel like we should all be on the same side. Um, and and I think that a lot of the the dialogue around AGI risk um, just isn't really grounded in any science, <laughs> which might be a hot take. But um, I, I think like there are people who do alignment work and and are are concerned about um, the long term impacts of these systems and like how do you design systems that like you know do the thing that you wanted them to do. Who I think are doing great stuff. Um, and, and I, I certainly think there, there should be more overlap in, in the interests, um, of, of, of both groups. Um, but the, the, like Skynet is not something that I think is a reasonable thing to worry about. Um, I can cross I, that off my list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's an interesting, um, graph that, um, uh, uh oh gosh, what's her name? Um, she's a, an AI climate researcher. She, or actually someone else made a slide that basically um, divvied up uh, people who who um, are often uh, uh, heard in, in popular media about um, AI, AI fairness and AI risk into like AI panic <laughs> <laughs> versus like AI fairness and AI ethics and stuff and like concerned AI practitioners. Um, and, and it was interesting to see the, the, how that group splits up um, because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the people driving the like AI panic, we need to be worried about AI taking over the world and driving humanity to extinction. Um, a lot of that community, A, are not practitioners, are, are not researchers. Um, 
and B, have a profit motive to, to be saying that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I did an interesting interview with with a great researcher on this on this topic. Actually, um, Dr. Emil Torres. They uh, just defended their PhD, um, and they also just put out um, a a book um, about uh, the history of of. Uh, human extinction, concepts of human extinction, existential risk in the Western world. And um, a lot of, I, I just ordered the book. It comes out, I believe, next week. Um, July 14th, I guess. Uh, and That was good. That, they, that, that felt like you did, the, you did the whole pitch. That was good. Yeah, I know. No. <laughs> um, but, but they've done a lot of work on um, basically looking at the, the, the groups who tend to be pushing um, concerns around existential risk and, and concerns around, you know, technologies wiping out humanity. Uh, and it does tend to be kind of the people at the top of society for whom mm. the only thing that could be a real problem for them would be the end of human civilization, mm. <laughs> which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't see a lot of existential risk uh, 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 movements in in, you know, people if, who are not at the top of the socioeconomic ladder yeah. if, um, if you're going to the food bank you're not worried about no China. yeah you've got yeah. sort of more proximate issues to yeah. yeah and and even if you are you know concerned about ai you're not concerned about skynet you're concerned about like whether you know the algorithm that determines whether or not you get approved for an apartment is biased mm. against you or something like that mm. um and and so i think that I guess the very long story short, um, when it comes to, to things that we should be concerned about for the future of the human race, in my opinion, um, I would say first climate, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, that is higher on my ladder currently than, than I would say, um, AI is, uh, yeah. uh as a, as a kind of more imminent, like, I mean, also something that, that, uh, has current harms, um, that that are typically felt by by people closer to the bottom of the the socioeconomic ladder, but in a global sense. Um, but I, when it comes to AI, the things that I'm concerned about um, tend to just be, you know, amplification and automation of of mm -hmm. existing biases and norms and structures that um, disenfranchise marginalized groups and mm -hmm. keep people who are currently in power in power and and things like that and the long term impacts of that when it, it becomes so much harder to interrogate um, how these systems work and, and what you would do to fix it. Mm. Um, and I feel like I, I, I try not to be like an AI doomer because I do think it's, it's a cool and interesting and like very useful technology for a lot of different reasons. Um, I just think like any other technology that we're, we're thinking about, uh, uh, making a norm for for the average person you know you have to think about how that intersects with equality and and cultures and other like human things <laughs> mm, yeah, um yeah, it's yeah. it's not something that you can just kind of take in the abstract and be like this will be fine um and and you know it's how how the tool is used as much as what how it's used tool? who has access to it like people there's there's a huge population of people in the u.s and and worldwide who don't have access to the internet <laughs> yeah, like yeah. It's, it's stuff like that where where um i i yeah I'm, I'm not super worried about like skynet or like agi going rogue and 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 pulling a like war game situation or anything like that um i i i think i I, I worry much more um, in the same way that I do for, for most other um, issues of our time, I guess I would say. Mm. Uh, I worry a lot more about the people. I, I worry yeah. about the people involved and who's not in the room and who has access and who doesn't and who's asking questions and who's interrogating things and things like that. Because actually, as much as it's much more exciting to imagine that all the... Well, not exciting, sort of morbidly exciting, <laughs> I guess, to... Um, uh, Exciting, I don't know. I do way. get a sense there's almost a 
th- th- those that are kind of um, suddenly worried about about these these big scenarios, that also it's kind of an excuse to maybe boast about their systems a little bit and be like, oh no, they're really good though. They could definitely. Um, but I suppose although that's the more exciting, uh, morbidly exciting thing to imagine is that all the nukes get launched and everything mm-hmm. explodes. Um, actually. The the ethical questions that 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 you're talking about about data, data goes in and therefore the decisions that come out. If we're going to offload a huge amount of our kind of thinking, I guess, to these yeah. systems, actually that that is going to have a huge impact. Yeah. Not maybe not one that explodes in a plume of smoke, but <laughs> one that is much more kind of uh, s- structural, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, I mean, hopefully it also doesn't explode in a plume of smoke, because that would also be bad. But um, I, I think that, you know, as with most systems and policies and things like that, um, it's all about, like, what kind of world do we want to create? <laughs> mm. And and I don't, I, I wouldn't say that I don't think that we're thinking about that. I would say that um, a lot of the people creating the systems have have uh very strong personal incentives to go in one direction and they represent roughly 0.1 percent of the population and everyone else would probably have a different opinion um and and so that that is uh that is always a concern um i guess the last quick note i'll make is is that uh the other reason why i find the 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 skynet um narrative to to be both interesting and, and frustrating, um, is that, you know, you see tech CEOs going to like Congress to talk about how artificial general intelligence is going to wipe out humanity and they need to do something. And I'm like, so how do you regulate that? <laughs> what law do you pass? <laughs> like, this is not, it's, 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 it's not something unlike if you look at, you know, more, more structural uh, potential harms or structural mm. concerns or, or socioeconomic concerns. Like those are things that you can regulate. A lot of AI policy is just policy, mm. but you need to consider AI. <laughs> um, yeah. Whereas AGI, like the end of the world is, is not something that you, you know, pass a law or like add something to your terms of service for yeah, <laughs> like i don't know so so um i i think that you know but in in some ways those are i don't know <laughs> I, I i find the the ethics stuff that that are real concerns f- sort of fascinating enough it feels like this really mm-hmm. it feels like what's interesting about a lot of these conversations whether it's about um ethics whether it's about um, jobs whether it's about what does it mean to create art in a world where mm-hmm. a computer can do it uh, yeah. it's this really interesting meeting point of science and uh, kind of culture humanities stuff yeah. as well um like i i find it fascinating when you've been explaining stuff and almost been talking about the ways in which there's like an unknowable thing in the middle of mm-hmm. the um of the system um which I guess is why these conversations are so interesting and why people find it so intriguing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think, you know, when when I started doing ML work eight years ago, whenever that was, um, I, I, I certainly didn't get into it to have these t- kinds of conversations and, and I didn't predict that it would end up where it is. Um, but I, I also... You know, as as frustrating, and I think part of this is also just like Twitter brain of like <laughs> the the fact that that app is imploding is probably good for everyone's mental health, including mine. <laughs> um, but but I do think that um, it's it's given me and and hopefully other people a lot of really interesting opportunities to to realize that you know science is political science is about people at the end of the day it's driven by people it's driven by their interests and and their desires and their biases and and all of it just comes down to people and and you know what people want um and and how that impacts everyone else and i i think i i guess i would say it's 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 an interesting thing 
to to it's an interesting conversation to 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 have grown into call it from when I was 18 to to now I I feel Mm -hmm. like these are not necessarily conversations of this scale (laughs) Mm -hmm. like just aren't things that that like 18 year olds are normally thinking about and now I'm like 26 and I'm like yeah I'm thinking about like how do you know how do you create systems that that make people feel empowered to cr- to take up space and like what do people actually want what kind of world do we want to build like that's not something that i feel like mm. people my age are normally thinking about and and um it's certainly stressful but it's also fun mm. well i mean on on that in- incredible incredible note thank you so much for uh for for sharing that expertise um with me and for everyone that's watching and viewing um if people haven't come across your stuff before uh, where where and how can they can they find you yeah i'm at jordan harrod on pretty much everything if you google my name i will show up uh at jordan b harrod on twitter instagram blue sky i think tiktok but yeah if you google me it'll come up so you can find me on the interwebs you've managed to get the blue sky invite i've i've, I've yet to uh I've yeah, yet to, uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe soon um yeah thank you thank you so so much and thank you to everyone for for listening Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to my chat with Jordan. I hope you found it as interesting as I did whilst we were recording it. As I mentioned partway through the show, if you want to get early access to new episodes of Induction, alongside a whole host of exclusive videos and more, then you can do so by signing up to Nebula at go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. Thanks so much again for watching or listening, and I will catch you in the next episode of the show.